Cogsburg, man! Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cogs Corner. That was that was a phenomenal, Mark. <laughs> Mark you. Fleming. He he's been banjoing around and practicing. Uh, pretty good stuff, I'd say. Sounds pretty damn good. That's probably the fastest I've ever played that song. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. He, he's, he broke a world record for us. <laughs> uh, welcome to Conk's Corner. My name is John Voth. That's Mark. Uh, oh, Dexter's down here. Let me grab Dexter. He's just lying on the floor looking up at me, making me feel guilty. Dexter's here as well, where I will read Harry Potter for an hour, because I haven't read it yet, and uh, I have only seen two of the movies when I was a teenager, don't remember anything from them. And that's what we're doing every day, just to have fun, just to distract ourselves, and to get together and laugh. Uh, I, I, I'm having a lot of fun doing this. Thanks for tuning in every night. It's just great. It is. Uh, okay, so what else? What else do I ramble through every single day? That, that got me pumped. <laughs> that got me really pumped. Yeah. I'm like, let's get through these announcements so I can read. <laughs> so please, uh, no spoilers, no hints in the comments. Okay, so this is what happened. Uh, last time, uh, the the recording, I couldn't save it. Instagram was changing some things, and I pressed save. It didn't save it, so I couldn't have it to upload to YouTube. Actually, so 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 I can maybe read the comments through doing that afterwards. Uh, I will give you a little uh, recap of yesterday for those people who couldn't, so a couple of people already asked. So yesterday, um, Crumb, you know, disappeared. Harry went to get to Dumbledore and Crumb disappeared. Oh, no, Crumb. Um, cr Crouch. I'm starting with the same K and C letters. Crouch disappeared. And uh, I theorized, I theorized that Crouch was st still hunting those Death Eaters. Um, what's that guy, Voldemort's little slave called? People Bottom? What, what is it? What's his name again? Po <laughs> People Bottom? <laughs> what's Wormtail. that guy's name? What? Wormtail? Wormtail, that's his name. <laughs> People Bottom. We're tail Bottom, it's kind of the same world. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, he, um, oh right, right, so, uh, not People Bottom, Wormtail was tasked to kill Crouch, but didn't succeed. This is what I'm theorizing. Didn't succeed, uh, and so that's why Crouch has disappeared. He was just walking around, I think, still in his obsession because of his uh, wife and kid dying. So that obsessed kind of weird world. Uh, nobody could find him. Uh, Karkaroff and and I, I think Karkaroff and Snape are Death Eaters because they got that whatever scar or burn or something on their arm that keeps flaring up when Voldemort uh, is around. And so... Those two are Death Eaters, and uh, Karkra uh, Crumb is kind of Karkaroff's underling, but not really. That's why he hates being around him. That's what I think. And so Crumb dragged Crouch off to Karkaroff. That's what, that's what I think about that. Um, then there was the Dream, which is really cool. Um, not too much to comment on that, other than... So Dexter... Uh, Dexter. I'm calling you Harry Potter. <laughs> Harry is linked to Voldemort. And I guess they can appear in each other's world or see what's currently happening in the other person's world. Uh, so kind of this vision thing. But, you know, they're somehow linked. Good old Peter People Bottom. <laughs> People Bottom. Um, <laughs> and uh, so then now he's put his face into a basin, Harry Potter has, and been zapped into this other world where uh, 200 witches and wizards are sitting in this grand hall, no doubt about to uh, debate... Harry Potter, I mean, Voldemort's appearing. So, that's what happened last time. Uh, I'm excited to get started on this, because I think it's picking up steam. There's going to be some crazy stuff happening. That's what I guess in this last big chunk. Uh, last thing, so if, if you want to catch up, I will try to post these on YouTube now. Go to my Patreon if you want to support me, because uh, now we're reading The Goldfinch and The Illustrated Man on there. Uh, and other than that, let's have some fun. Give me a... One, two, five. This, that was a bad one. That wasn't that great. That was okay. Okay, let's go. We stopped right when he flashed down and got sat next to Dumbledore and tried to talk to him, but Dumbledore didn't talk back. <laughs> Once before, Harry had found himso himself somewhere that nobody could see or hear him. That time, he had fallen through a page in an, in an enchanted diary, right into someone else's memory. Uh, oh, oh, right. No, I remember that now. 
It just uh, didn't pop up right then. And unless he was very much mistaken, something of the sort had happened again. Harry raised his right hand, hesitated, and then waved it energetically in front of Dumbledore's face. <laughs> It'd be funny if he's always going, Hello! Hello! <laughs> Dumbledore did not blink, look, uh, look around at Harry, or indeed move at all. And that, in Harry's opinion, settled the matter. Dumbledore wouldn't ignore him like that. Dumbledore wouldn't ignore him like that. He was inside a memory, and this was not the present-day Dumbledore. Yet it couldn't be that long ago. The Dumbledore sitting next to him now was silver-haired, just like the present-day Dumbledore. But what was this place? What were all these wizards waiting for? How old is Dumbledore? Did they say something like 900 years? No. I can't remember, but he's old. Yeah, he's, he's so old. Hi, Allie. I, if somebody knows Dumbledore's age, throw it in there, unless it's some kind of spoiler or twist or something like that. Uh, before Harry could reach any conclusions about the place in which they were, he heard footsteps. The door in the corner of the dungeon opened, and three people entered, or at least one man flanked by two Dementors. Harry's insides went cold. The Dementors, tall, hooded creatures whose face, faces were concealed, were gliding slowly towards the chair in the center of the room, each grasping one of the man's arms with their dead and rotten-looking hands. The man between them looked as though he was about to faint, and Harry couldn't blame him. He knew the Dementors could not touch him inside a memory, but Harry remembered their power only too well. The watching crowd recoiled slightly, at, slightly as the the Dementors placed the man in the chain chair and glided back out of the room. The door swung shut behind them. Harry looked down at the man now sitting in the chair and saw that it was Karkaroff. Okay. Unlike Dumbledore, Karkaroff looked much young younger. His hair and goatee were black. He was not dressed in sleek furs, but in thin and ragged robes. He was shaking. Even as Harry watched, the chains on the arms of the, ch of the chair glowed suddenly gold and snaked their way up his arms, binding him there. Uh, who's saying this? Mr. Kr Igor Karkaroff, said a curt voice to Harry's left. Harry looked around and saw Mr. Crouch standing up in the middle of the bench beside him. I think this could, could use some tense music, eh? This is, this is not as peaceful and nice. If, it, if it'll run. Are you doing Budge's voice for Crouch right now? No. Oh, okay. No. Thank you, though. I did last time. Or is it something similar? Uh, where are we? Oh, yeah. S said a curt voice to Harry's left. Harry looked around and saw Mr. Crouch standing up in the middle of the bench beside him. Crouch's hair was dark. His face was much less lined. He looked fit and alert. You have been brought from Azkaban to give evidence to the Ministry of Magic. You have given us to understand that you have important information for us. Karkaroff straightened himself as best he could, tightly bound to the chair. Uh, 150. Cool. That's, I mean, that, that's how old, apparently, uh, Dumbledore is. Karkaroff stra straightened himself as best he could, tightly bound to the chair. I hear, sir, he said. And although his voice was very scared, okay, scared, Harry could still hear the familiar, unctuous note in it. I wish to be of, of use to the Ministry. I wish to help. I, I, I know that the Ministry is trying to, to round up the last of the Dark Lord's supporters. I am eager to assist in any way I can. There was a murmur around the benches. Some of the wizards and witches were surveying Karkaroff with interest. Others from Dumbledore's, um, others with pronounced mistrust. Then Harry heard, quite distinctly, from Dumbledore's other side, a familiar, growling voice saying, Filth! Harry leant forward so that he could see past Dumbledore. Mad-Eye Moody was sitting there, though there was a very noticeable difference in his appearance. He did not have his magical eye, but two normal ones, both looking down upon Karkaroff, and both were narrowed in intense dislike. Crouch is going to let his Crouch is going to let him out. Moody breathed quietly to Dumbledore. He's done a deal with him. Took me six months to track him down. And Crouch is going to let him go if he's got enough new names. Let's hear this let's hear his information, I say. 
and throw him straight to back to the Dementors. Ugh. Gotta hear my mouth or something. Blah, blah. Okay. Dumbledore made a small noise of dissent through his long, crooked nose. Wait, okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Through his long, crooked nose. Ah, I was forgetting. You don't like the Dementors, do you, Albus? Said Moody with a sardonic smile. No, said Dumbledore calmly. I'm afraid I don't. I have long felt the Ministry is wrong to ally itself with such creatures. But for a filth like this, Moody said softly. You, you, uh, you say you have names. No, no. You say you have names for us, Carcro, said Mr. Crouch. Let us hear them, please. You must understand, said Carcroft hurriedly, that he who must not be named operated always in the greatest secrecy. He preferred that we, I mean to say his supporters, and I regret now very deeply that I ever counted myself among them. Get on with it, sneered Moody. We never knew the names of every one of our fellows. He alone knew exactly who, all, uh, who we all were. Which was a wise move, wasn't it? As I prevented someone like you, Carcroft, turning all of them in, muttered... Oh, no, sorry. Sorry, this is Mark Moody now. Which was a, a wise move, wasn't it? As I prevented someone like you, Carcroft, turning all of them in, muttered Moody. Yet you say you have some names for us? I, I do, said Carcroft breathlessly. And these are important supporters. Mark you... People I saw with my own eyes doing his bidding. I give this information as a sign that I fully and totally renounce him and am filled with a remorse so deep I can barely... Those names are, said Mr. Crouch sharply. Karkaroff drew a deep breath. There was Antonin, uh, Antonin Dolohov, he said. I, I saw him torture countless muggles and and non-supporters of the Dark Lord. And we helped them, uh, and helped them do it, muttered Moody. We have already ap apprehended Dullahove, said C Crouch. He was caught shortly after yourself. Indeed, said Karkarov, his eyes widening. I, I am delighted to hear it. <laughs> He's such a groveling little... I, I expected he had a bit of a uh, stronger backbone, that character, but apparently not. Hello, Kristen, welcome. But he didn't look it. Harry could tell that this news had come as a real blow to him. One of his names was worthless. Any others? said Crouch coldly. Why, like, yes. There was Rosier, uh, he said Karkaroff hurriedly. Even Rosier. R Rosier. Um, Rosier is dead, said Crouch. He was caught shortly after you were, too. He preferred to fight rather than come in quietly, and was killed in the struggle. Um, took me a bit of him. Uh, took took a bit of uh, took a bit of me with him, though. No, <laughs> that uh, took took a bit of me with him. They whispered Moody to Harry's right. Harry looked around at him once more and saw him indicating the large chunk out of his nose to Dumbledore. Oh, okay. So he he's hunted so many of them. Wow. No, no more than Rosier deserved, said Karkaroff, a real note of panic in his voice now. Harry could see that he was starting to worry that none of his information would be any use to the ministry. Karkaroff's eyes darted toward the, toward the door in the corner, behind which the Dementors undoubtedly still stood, watching. Any more, said Crouch. Yes, said Karkaroff. There, there was Travers. He helped me murder the McKinnons. Mulciber, he specialized in the imperious curse, forced countless people to do horrific things. Rookwood, who was a spy, and passed he, who must not be named, useful information from inside the ministry itself. Harry could tell that this time, Karkaroff had struck gold. The watching crowd were all murmuring together. Rookwood said Mr. Crouch, nodding to a witch sitting in front of him, who began scribbling upon her piece of parchment. Augustus Rookwood, of the, depa of the Department of Mysteries. The very same, 
said Karkaroff. I believe he, he used a, a network of, of well-placed wizards, both inside the Ministry and out, to collect information. But Travers and Mulsifer, Mulsifer we have, said Mr. Crouch. Very well, Karkaroff. If that is all, you will be returned to Azkaban while we decide. Not yet, cried Karkaroff, looking quite desperate. Wait, wait I, I, I have more. Harry could see him sweating in the torchlight, his white skin contrasting strongly with the black, with the black of his hair and beard. Snape! He shouted. Severus Snape! Snape has been cleared by this council," said Crouch coldly. "He has been vouched for by Albus Dumbledore." No! shouted Karkaroff, straining at the chains which bound him to the chair. I assure you, Severus Snape is a Death Eater! I swear, if he is, I'm just gonna stop streaming because there's no point. I know the whole story already. Oh, really? <laughs> I can just predict all, th all three and a half books from here on in. <laughs> Okay, where were we? Dumbledore had got to his feet. I have given evidence already on this matter, he said calmly. Severus Snape was indeed a Death Eater. However, he rejoined our side before Lord Voldemort's downfall and turned spy for us at great personal risk. He is no, no, he's now no more a Death Eater than I am. Harry turned to look at Mad-Eye Moody. Um, looked at Mad-Eye Moody. He was wearing a, lo a look of deep skepticism behind Dumbledore's back. Very well, Karkaroff, Crouch said coldly. You have been of assistance. I shall review your case. You will return to Azkaban in the meantime. Mr. Grou Crouch's voice faded. Harry looked around. The dungeon was dissol dissolving as though it was made of smoke. Everything was fading. He could only see his own body. All else was swirling darkness. And then the dungeon turned, returned. Harry was sitting in a different seat, still on the highest bench, but now to the left side of Mr. Crouch. What? Oh, okay, no, we're still, we're still, we're, okay, we're still in it. I thought he went back to the main room, but he did not. Uh, welcome, Beck Pusette and Kenton. Hello, Kenton. But I wish you weren't on. And then the dungeon returned. Harry was sitting in a different seat, still on the highest bench, but now to the left side of Mr. Crouch. The atmosphere seemed quite different. Relaxed, even cheerful. The witches and wizards all around the, the walls were talking to each other, almost as though they were at some sort of sporting event. A witch, halfway up the rows of benches, opposite caught Harry's eye. She had short, blonde hair and wearing magenta robes, and was sucking the end of an acid green quill. It was unmistakably, unmistake, unmistakably, a younger Rita Skeeter. Okay, well, well. Harry looked around. I wonder what this basin is. It's like a memory bowl. It's probably... Or make like an evidence, like a, a evidence file, you know? <laughs> you know, if you need evidence for something, you file the memory, and then you go and you put your face into a base, and it's like, what happened here? <laughs> um, Dumbledore was sitting beside him and again, wearing different robes. Mr. Crouch looked tireder and somehow fiercer, gaunter. Harry understood. It was a different memory, a different day, a different trial. The door in the corner opened, and Ludo Bagman walked into the room. This was not, however, a Ludo Bagman gone to seed, but a Ludo Bagman who was clearly at the height of his Quidditch playing fitness. His nose wasn't broken now. He was tall and lean and muscly. Bagman looked nervous. What a name, Bagman. Bagman looked nervous as he sat down in the chain chair, but it did not bind him there. As it, as, had, as it had bound Karkaroff. And Bagman, perhaps taking heart from this, glanced around at the watching crowd, waved at, a, waved at a couple of them, and managed a small smile. Who sang this? Ludo Bagman. 
You have been brought here in front of the Council of Magical Law to answer, to answer charges relating to the activities of the Death Eaters, said Mr. Crouch. We have heard the evidence against you, and are about to reach our verdict. Do you have anything to add to your testimony before we pronounce judgment? Harry couldn't believe his ears. Ludo Bagman? A Death Eater? Uh, okay. Uh, 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 uh. uh on only, said Bagman, smiling awkwardly. Well, uh, I know I've been a bit of an idiot. One or two wizards and watches, uh, wi <laughs> wizards and witches in the surrounding seats smiled in indulgently. Mr. Crouch did not appear to share their feelings. He was staring down at Ludo Bagman with an expression of the utmost severity and dislike. You never, sp um, Dumbledore. You never spoke a truer word, boy. Someone muttered dryly to Dumbledore behind Harry. Oh, I don't know. Oh, it's Moody. He looked around and saw Moody si sitting there again. If I didn't know, he'd always been dim. I'd have some. S I've, I, I, I've had. Um, I'd have said some of those bludgers have permanently affected his brain. Lud Ludovic Bagman. You are caught passing information to Lord Voldemort's supporters, said Mr. Crouch. For this, I suggest a term of imprisonment in Azkaban, lasting no less than... But there was an angry outcry from the surrounding benches. Several of the witches and wizards around the walls stood up, shaking their heads and even their fists at Mr. Crouch. I told you! I had no idea! Bagman called earnestly over the crowd's babble, his round eyes widening. None, none at all! O old Rookwood was a friend of my dad's. Never crossed my mind. He was in with you-know-who. I, I thought I was collecting information for our side. And Rookwood kept talking about getting me a job in the ministry later on. Uh, once my Quidditch days are over, you know. I mean, I can't keep getting hit by bludgers for the rest of my life, can I? There were titters from the crowd. It will be put... To the vote, said Mr. Crouch coldly. He turned to the right-hand side of the dungeon. The jury will please raise their hands. Those in favor of imprisonment. Surprised I didn't predict this. Uh, what do you mean, this? Predict what? That Ludo Bagman's a Death Eater? I did say that Ludo Bagman was in on that, uh, that, that whole uh, Karkaroff Snape plan. I did say that. So, uh... Yeah, you just you take that. <laughs> yeah, you did it, John. Good job, John. Really you, you you got her. Yeah, John. <laughs> uh, okay. We put the, uh, Harry looked towards the right hand side of the dungeon. Not one pe not one person raised their hand. What is all this? There we go. Um, one of the witches of of, of on the, sorry. Many of the witches and wizards around the walls began to clap. One of the witches on the, on the jury stood up. Yes, barked Crouch. We'd, like, we, we'd just like to congratulate Mr. Bagman on his splendid performance for England in the Quidditch match against Turkey last Saturday, the witch said breathlessly. Mr. Crouch looked furious. <laughs> That's really funny. That's really funny. The dungeon was ringing with applause now. It feels like Bagman's like half a Lockhart with his fame. Uh, Bagman got to his feet and bowed, beaming. Despicable, Mr. Crouch spat at Dumbledore, sitting down as Bagman walked out of the dungeon. Rook would, uh, Rook would get him a job indeed. The day Ludo Bagman joins us will be a very sad day for the Ministry and the dungeon dissolved, dissolved again. When it had returned, Harry looked around. He and Dumbledore were still sitting beside Mr. Crouch, but the atmosphere could not have been more different. There was a total silence, broken only by the dry sobs of a frail, wispy-looking witch in the seat next to Mr. Crouch. She was clutching a hand handkerchief to her mouth with trembling hands. Harry looked up at Crouch and saw that he looked gaunter and grayer than ever before. A nerve was twitching in his temple. Bring them in, he said, and his voice echoed through the silent dungeon. The door in the corner opened again. 
Six Dementors entered this time, flanking a group of four people. Harry saw the people in the crowd turn to look up at Mr. Crouch. A few of them whispered to each, which whispered to each other. The Dementors placed each of the four people in the four chairs with chained arms, which now stood, the, which now stood on the dungeons in the floor. There was a thick-set man who stared blankly up at Crouch. What is all it's all a bit too intense and loud. The beginning is good, okay. Um, there was a thick-set man who stared blankly up at Crouch, a thinner and more nervous-looking man, whose eyes were darting, darting around the crowd. A woman with thick, shining, dark hair and heavily hooded eyes, who was sitting in a chained chair as though it were a throne and a boy in his late teens, who looked nothing short of petrified. Oh, is that, is that Voldemort? Is that you, evil Bannister of Hell? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. All the words I might have he heard somewhere in English just pop up, and I don't even, I don't even know what Bannister means. Bannister, like, like a railing. <laughs> He's an evil railing from hell. <laughs> oh, that's like not what, what is it? What is it? Um, I can't. What is uh Voldemort saying again on the wall? What is that saying? Uh, Tom Riddle, I am Lord Voldemort. Tom Tom Marvel Marvel Riddle, I am Lord Voldemort. Ba barrister? Maybe I meant barrister. What's a barrister? Like a like a lawyer? Barista. A lawyer? Yeah, bar barrister. Evil barrister of hell. So. I'm just going to call Voldemort the evil railing from hell. <laughs> <laughs> That's his nickname. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, Tom Morello Mar Grill. Barrister is a lawyer, right? I don't know why that came out. Okay, I'm going to keep on reading. Uh, he was shivering, his straw-colored hair all over his face, his freckled skin milk-white, the wispy little witch beside Crouch began to rock backwards and forwards in her seat, whimpering into her handkerchief. Crouch stood up. He looked down upon the four in front of him, and there was pure hatred in his face. You have been brought here before the Council of Magical Law, he said clearly, so that we may pass judgment on you for a crime so heinous Father, said the boy with the straw-colored hair. Oh, no. Oh, are we going to see this now? Yep. Oh, no. That's awful. I don't like this at all. I don't like this at all. This poor kid, kind of. I don't know, but, oh, gosh. Said the boy with straw-colored hair. Father, please. That we have rarely heard the like of it within this court, said Crouch speaking more loudly, drowning out his son's voice. We have heard the evidence against you. The four of you stand accused of capturing an aura, Frank Longbottom, and subjecting him to the cruciatious curse, believing him to have the knowledge of the present whereabouts of your exiled master, he who must not be named. Father, I didn't! shrieked the boy in chains below. I didn't, I swear it, father. Don't send me back to the Dementors. You are further accused, bellowed Mr. Crouch, of using the cruciatus curse on Frank Longbottom's wife. When he would not give you information, you planned to restore he who must not be named to power and to resume the lives of violence you presumably led while he was strong. I now ask the jury, Mother! screamed the boy below, and the wispy little witch besides Crouch began to sob, rocking backwards and forwards. Mother, stop him! Mother, I didn't do it! It wasn't me! I now ask the jury, shouted Mr. Crouch, to raise their hands if they believe, as I do, that these crimes deserve a life sentence in Azkaban! In unison, the witches and wizards along the right-hand side of the dungeon raised their hands. The crowds all around the walls began to clap as it had for Bagman, their faces full of savage triumph. The boy began to scream, No, mother, no, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't, no! Don't send me there, don't let him! 
The Dementors were gliding back into the room. The boy's three companions rose quietly from their seats. This is awful. The woman with the heavy lidded eyes looked up at Crouch and, call, and, and called, The Dark Lord will rise again, Crouch! Throw us into Azkaban! We will wait! He will rise again and will come for us! He will reward us beyond any of his other supporters! We alone were faithful! We alone tried to find him! But the boy was trying to fight the Dementors off, even though Harry could see their cold, draining power starting to affect him. The crowd were jeering, some of them on their feet, as the woman swept out of the dungeon, and the boy continued to, to struggle. I'm your son! He screamed at Crouch. I'm your son! You are no son of mine! bellowed Mr. Crouch, his eyes bulging suddenly. I have no son. The wispy witch beside him gave a great gasp and slumped in her seat. She had fainted. Crouch appeared to have not to notice. Take them away! Crouch roared at the Dementors, spit flying from his mouth. Take them away, and may they rot there! Father! Father, I wasn't involved! No, no, Father, please! Uh, who's saying this? I think, Harry, it is time to return to my office, said a quiet voice in Harry's ear. Oh my gosh. What do you think Dumbledore is going to say about Harry snooping and putting his head in the thing? I think Dumbledore planned it, or already knew. <laughs> Probably wanted to give him evidence. Damn, that was... Oh, I don't like that at all. I don't like that. Yeah, that was intense. Yeah. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Jeez, so much therapy needed in the Crouch family. Yeah, tell me about it. Crouch needs some time on the couch. <laughs> oh, man. Jamie, you nailed it. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I like that a lot. Um, Harry started. He looked around. Then he looked on his other side. What do you think about the torture of Neville's parents? What torture of Neville's parents? Yeah, the, um, when they were learning about the Cruciatus Curse, remember, or not the Cruciatus, the the one that, yeah, the Cruciatus Curse, remember um, Neville was really upset and intense about it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, explain it, that was one detail that I've actually completely forgotten. Something, because... hap something happened to his parents. Oh, but we don't know. Well, I think it was also kind of confirmed later. Okay. In some weird detail that they found out somewhere, if I'm remembering right. Okay, well, you just skipped past it. These, these were the folks who did it. Well, don't... Just tell me what I, what I need to know. Is oh, me? right, right, right. So they, they said, remember when it was, uh, you know, they put the three kids on trial, or the four kids on trial. The people that they did the Cruciatus Curse to get information out of was Neville Longbottom's parents. And it right. says their names. And uh, we don't know why exactly. Because they were both Death Eaters, or why? Not, well... Yeah, we don't really know exactly. We don't know yet. Okay. Yeah. So they already talked about a, a torture. Anyway, if somebody can just write out what, what happened till now in relation to that, so I can read through it, but that, not like in the future, and nothing I wouldn't know through reading these books. Yeah, nobody's sitting. I would appreciate that. Yeah, maybe somebody write that out so that I, I grasp it. Okay, here we go. Um, there was Am Albus Dumbledore sitting on his right, watching Crouch's son being dragged away by the Dementors. And there was Albus Dumbledore on his left, looking right at him. Come, said Dumbledore on his left, and he put his hand under Harry's elbow. <sighs> Dumbledore in two places. Harry felt himself rising into the air. The dungeon dissolved around him. For a moment, all was blackness, and then he felt as though he had done a slow-motion somersault, suddenly landing flat on his feet in what seemed like the dazzling light of Dumbledore's sunlit office. The stone basin was shimmering in the cabinet in front of him, and Albus Dumbledore was standing beside him. Professor, Harry gasped, I, I, I know I shouldn't, I, 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 I didn't mean, the cabin door was sort of open and, I quite understand, said Dumbledore. He, he lifted the basin, carried, carried it over to his desk, placed it upon the polished top, and sat down in the chair behind it. He motioned Harry to sit down opposite him. Harry did so, staring at the stone basin. The contents had returned to their original silvery white state, swirling and rippling beneath, the uh, beneath, beneath his gaze. 
Okay, and that was why Neville had that. Yeah, but why why was why was, were his parents tortured? But they were tortured by by those four kids. Those four kids. Gotcha. One of which is Crouch's son. Ah. Right. To get information. Right. Okay. 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 Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. What is it? Harry asked shakily. This. It is called a pensive, said Dumbledore. I sometimes find, and I'm sure you know the feeling, that I have simply far too many thoughts and memories crammed into my mind. Uh, said Harry, who couldn't truth truthfully say that he had ever felt anything of the sort. At these times, said Dumbledore, indicating the stone basin, I use the pensive. One simple siphons the excessive thoughts from one's mind, pours them into the basin, and examines them at one's leisure. It becomes easier to spot patterns and links, you understand, when they are in this form. You mean that stuffs your thoughts? Harry said, swir staring at the swirling white substance in the bas basin. Certainly, said Dumbledore. Let me show you. Dumbledore drew his wand out of the inside of his robes and placed the tip into his own silvery hair near his temple. When he took the wand away, hair seemed to be clinging to it. But then Harry saw that it was in fact a glistening strand of the same strange silvery white substance that filled the pensive. Dumbledore added this fresh thought to the basin and Harry, astonished, saw his own face swimming around the surface of the bowl. <laughs> I don't know. I like that it's a fresh thought. <laughs> yeah, check this out, Harry. I don't know why I find that so funny. It's a funny detail. Dumbledore placed his long hands on either side of the pensive and swirled it, rather as a gold prospector would swirl for fragments of gold. And Harry saw his own face change smoothly into Snape's. Huh? Oh, okay. And Harry saw his own face change smoothly, smoothly into Snape's, who opened his mouth and spoke to the ceiling, his voice echoing slightly. It's coming back. Cockross to stronger and clearer than ever. A connection I, I could have made without assistance, Dumbledore sighed. Ah, but never mind. He peered over the top of his half-moon spectacles at Harry, who was gaping at Snape's face, which continued to swirl around the bowl. I was using the pensive when Mr. Fudge arrived for our meeting and put it away rather hastily. Undoubtedly, I did not fasten the cabinet door properly. Naturally, it would have attracted your attention. I'm sorry, Harry mumbled. Dumbledore shook his head. Sir, curiosity is not a sin, he said, but we should exercise caution with our curiosity. Yes, indeed. Frowning slightly, he prodded the thoughts within the basin with the tip of his wand. Instantly, a figure rose out of it, a plump, scowling girl of around sixteen, who began to revolve slowly with her feet still in the basin. She took no notice whatsoever of Harry or Professor Dumbledore. When she spoke, her voice echoed as Snape's had done, as though it was coming from the depths of the stone basin. Uh, okay, who's saying this, though? Bertha. Bertha Jorkins. Jor um, okay, what's, what's, uh, how would you describe Bertha Jorkins? Do you know? I don't know. Okay. It says there that she's 16, though, doesn't it? Yeah. He put a hex on me, Professor Dumbledore, and I was only teasing him, sir. I, I, I only said I'd seen him kissing florets behind the greenhouses last Thursday. But why, Bertha? said Dumbledore sadly, looking at, up at the now silently revolving girl. Why did you have to follow him in the first place? Bertha, forgettable, nosy. Kind of dim, okay. Well, that voice kind of works then. Bertha. Harry whispered, looking up at her. Is that, is that Bertha Jorkins? Yes, said Dumbledore, prodding the thoughts in the basin again. Bertha sank back into them, and they became silvery and opaque once more. That was Bertha, as I remember her, at, a, at school. The silvery light from the pensive illuminated Dumbledore's face, and it struck Harry suddenly how very old he was looking. 
He knew, of course, that Dumbledore was getting on in years, but somehow he never really thought of Dumbledore as an old man. So, Harry, said Dumbledore quietly, before you get lost in my thoughts, you wanted to tell me something. Yes, said Harry. Professor, I was in divination just now, and uh, I fell asleep. He hesitated here, w wondering if a reprimand was coming, but Dumbledore merely said, Quite understandable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love him. I love him so much. He's awesome. Continue. Well, I had a dream, said Harry. A dream about Lord Voldemort. He was torturing Wormtail. You, you know who Wormtail... I do know, said Dumbledore promptly. Please, continue. Voldemort got a letter from an owl. He said something like... Vol uh, Wormtail's blunder had been repaired. He said someone was dead. Then he said, Wormtail, Wormtail wouldn't be fed to the snake. There was a snake beside his chair. He said, he said he'd be feeding meat to it instead. Then he did the cruciate, cruciate, uh, cruciatus curse on w uh, Wormtail, and my scar hurt. Harry said, it woke me up. It hurt so bad. It hurt so badly. Dumbledore merely looked at him. Hello, bonjour, and hello, Sarah Rogers. Hello, bonjour. Hello, bonjour. Uh, and Dumbledore merely looked at him. Uh, that's all, said Harry. Ah, oh, I see, said Dumbledore quietly. I see. Now, has your scar hurt at any other time this year, except the time it woke you up over the summer? No, I... Uh, how did you know it woke me up over the summer? said Harry, astonished. You, you are not serious only correspondent, said Dumbledore. I have also... <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> okay. Um, I have also been in contact with him ever since he left Hogwarts last year. It was I who suggested the mountainside cave as the safest place for him to stay. Dumbledore got up and began walking up and down behind his desk. Every now and then he placed his wand tip to his temple, removing another shining light, th though, thought, and adding it to the pensive. Why? Why, though? Oh, he's just continuously getting thoughts out? Is that what yeah. he does all the time? He said it's easier to organize and look at them and make connections. Yeah, that's cool. The thoughts inside began to swirl so fast that Harry couldn't make out anything clearly. It was merely a blur of color. Professor, he said quietly, after a couple of minutes. Dumbledore stopped pacing and looked at Harry. My apologies, he said quietly. He sat back. Oh, no. My apologies, he sat, said quietly. He sat back down at his desk. Oh, oh this is interesting. A little bit of uh, emotional Dumbledore, I think, we got going on here. Do you, do you know why my scar's hurting me? Dumbledore looked very intently at Harry for a moment and, and then said, I have a theory. No more than that. It is my belief that your scar hurts both when Vol Lord Voldemort is near you and when he is feeling a particularly strong surge of hatred. But why? Because you and he are connected by the curse that failed, said Dumbledore. That is no ordinary scar. So you think that dream, did it really happen? It is, it is possible, said Dumbledore. I would say probable. Harry, did you see Voldemort? No, said Harry, just the back of his chair. But there wouldn't have been anything to see, uh, would there? I mean, he hasn't got a body, has he? But, but then how could he have held the wand? Harry said slowly. How oh, indeed, muttered Dumbledore. How oh, indeed. Neither Dumbledore nor Harry spoke for a while. Dumbledore was gazing ac ac across the room, every now and then placing his wand tip to his temple and adding another shining silver thought to the seething mass within the pensive. Uh, to keep them intact, the memories aren't ch changed over time in the mind. Oh, I like that aspect too. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. That is awesome. I like that. Uh... Professor, Harry said at last, do you think he's getting stronger? Voldemort, 
said Dumbledore, looking at Harry over the pet scene. It was the characteristic, piercing look Dumbledore had given him on other occasions, and always made Harry feel as though Dumbledore was seeing right through him, in a way that even Moody's magical eye could not. Once again, Harry, I can only give you my suspicions. Dumbledore sighed again, and he looked older and wearier than ever. The years of Voldemort's ascent to power, he said, were marked with disappearances. Bertha Jorkins had vanished without a trace in the place where Voldemort was certainly known to be last. Mr. Crouch, too, has disappeared within these very grounds. And there was a third disappearance, one with the Ministry. I regret to say, does not consider of any importance, for it concerns a muggle. His name was Frank Bryce. He lived in the village where Voldemort's father grew up, and he was not only been seen, and he has not been seen since last August. You see, I read the muggle newspapers, and like most of my ministry friends, Dumbledore looked very seriously at Harry. These disappearances seem to me to be linked. The ministry disagrees, as you may have heard, while waiting outside my office. Harry nodded. Silence fell between them again, Dumbledore extracting thoughts every now and then. Harry felt as though he ought to go, but his curiosity held him in his chair. So uh, Frank was the guy at the very beginning. Frank Bryce, the old dude. Poor guy. Harry nodded. Silent, okay, but Harry felt as though he ought to go, but his curiosity held him in his chair. Professor, he said again. Yes, Harry, said Dumbledore. Uh, could, I, could I ask you about that court thing I was in, in the pensive? You could, said Dumbledore heavily. I attended it many times, but some trials come back to me more clearly than others. Particularly now. You know, you know the trial you found me in, the, the one with Crouch's son. Well, are they talking about Neville's parents? Dumbledore gave Harry a very sharp look. Has Neville never told you why he has been brought up by his grandmother? He said. Harry shook his head, wondering as he did so how he could have failed to ask Neville this in almost four years of knowing him. Yeah, because he just think he's just this screw up, you know. We just have to protect, protect the guy. We don't have to get to know him. Uh, yes, they were talking about Neville's parents, said Dumbledore. His father, Frank, was an aura, just like Professor Moody. He and his wife were tortured for information about Voldemort's whereabouts after he lost his powers, as you have heard. So they're dead, said Harry quietly. No, said Dumbledore, his voice full of bitterness. Harry had never heard there before. They are insane. They are both in St. Mungus Hospital for magical maladies and in injuries. I believe Neville visits them with his grandmother during the holidays. They do not recognize him. Harry sat there, horror-struck. He had never known, never in four years, bothered to find out. Oh, Neville. That's awful. This chapter is a feel bad chapter. Oh, it's a, it's a whole bunch of, yeah, it's a whole bunch of dads killing their sons and sons losing their parents in a way. Oh my gosh. So heartbreaking. Imagine visiting your parents and they don't, don't recognize you and they're crazy. As a kid too. Yikes. Yuck. Yuck to this cha chapter. No, it's a good chapter. It's a, it's a heavy, heavy chapter. The Longbottoms were very popular, said Dumbledore. The attacks on them came after Voldemort's fall from power. Just when, every, just when everyone thought they were safe, those attacks caused a wave of fury such as I have never known. The Ministry was under great pressure to, ca to catch those we have done it. Unfortunately, the Longbottom's evidence was, given their condition, none too reliable. 
then Mr. Crouch's son might not have been involved? said Harry slowly. Dumbledore shook his head. As to that, I have no idea. Harry sat in silence one more, once more, watching the contents of the pensive swirl. There were two more questions he was burning to ask, but they concerned the guilt of living people. Uh, he said, Mr. Bagman has never been accused of any dark activity since, said Dumbledore calmly. Right, said Harry hastily, staring at the contents of the pensive again. Character development perfect combined with more unanswered questions. Totally. That's so true. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's the amended chapter. Right, said Harry hastily, staring at the contents of the pensive again, which were swirling more slowly than now that Dumbledore had stopped adding th thoughts. And, uh, but the pensive seemed to be asking his question for him. Snape's face was swimming on the surface again. Dumbledore glanced down into it and th then up at Harry. No more has Professor Snape, he said. Harry looked into Dumbledore's light blue eyes and the thing he really wanted to know spilled out of his mouth before he could stop it. What made you think he'd really stopped supporting Voldemort, Professor? Dumbledore held Harry's gaze for, for a few seconds and then said, that, Harry, is a matter between Professor Snape and myself. Harry knew that the interview was over. Dumbledore did not look angry, yet there was a finality in his tone that told Harry it was time to go. He stood up, and so did Dumbledore. Harry, he said, as Harry reached the door, please do not speak about Neville's parents to anybody else. He has the right to let people know when he is ready. Yes, Professor, said Harry, turning to go. And Harry looked back. Dumbledore was standing over the pensive, his face lit from beneath by its silvery spots of light, looking older than ever. He stared at Harry for a moment and then said, Good luck with the third task. This was a fantastic chapter. Yeah. The pensive and this... Pensive, yeah, this Pensive chapter was so good. Man, I loved it. I'm going to keep on reading. I'm going to, I'm going to do uh, longer today, for sure. Uh, wow, I, I, that was awesome. First of all, though, those different trials and all those revel revelations. And then this whole interaction between um, Harry and Dumbledore and Har Dumbledore being, like, getting older and older and removing these thoughts. Yeah, sure, retaining them, but also not wanting them in his head. He's weighed down by so much. But he keeps up such a good exterior. <laughs> you know, I love that. I love that. All right. Let's get to some questions, shall we? Oh, that didn't pop up for some reason. Okay. It's not popping up. What the heck? Oh, there. Carrie Boone. Can you... M. Just M. Can you try to predict the next three books? <laughs> okay, so in the next book... Harry comes across uh, this this uh, guy who c c comes into a room and says, which one of these pills do you want to take, the red or the, or the green, <laughs> the blue one? He takes the blue one. That's The and Matrix, he... John. I've never heard of this movie. I don't know what you're talking about. Whoa, yeah. I never thought I'd ever hear you say and that. And then the book after that, he has this dog, and this dog's a golden retriever. And this golden retriever is so happy to see him all the time, does all these goofy antics, but at the end, the dog dies. And the dog's name is Marley. Um, and and uh, yeah, yeah. So I, th I think that's how they go. Oh, and, and, the, and the third, uh, the third um, book, in the third book, um, it's uh, Harry on stage with Ron. And they're just talking to each other the whole time about nothing while they're waiting for somebody. Okay, those are my predictions of the next three books. What's your favorite costume you've ever worn for Halloween or otherwise? I think I answered this one. I, I have I had this... Uh, Weird dog mask, which I actually should use and show you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to use it maybe next time. Uh, with this weird winged furry, not furry, you know what I mean. <laughs> the costume was furry. Uh, do you think Harry will ever get in trouble with Dumbledore? Yes, I think he'll get in trouble for um, doing something out of character for, for Harry. Doing something 
against what the good is or the the strong characteristic is. I think that's when when uh, Hagrid, uh, Harry will get Dumbledore will get angry with uh, with Harry. Tomorrow is my birthday, and today we got my fave chapter of the book. Thanks for the company. Hey, man. Uh, you know, just do the thing of rem the awkward thing of reminding us it's your birthday tomorrow. In case I don't remember, I'm gonna write it down. But just you know, remind us because we want to celebrate your birthday together. Uh, if you could play one of the characters in an H a Harry Potter movie remake, who would you choose and why? Uh, I, I, th I think we got this question before. I think uh, I, I would love to play Hagrid. He'd be super fun and Lockhart. Lockhart would be super fun or serious. One of those three. What was your favorite revelation in this chapter? Um, well, the, the favorite, my favorite section, even though it's heartbreaking, but it's like so dramatic, is Crouch sending his son off to, to die. It's like, oh, it, it, it didn't feel cheap. It felt earned. And uh, it was just so character-wise, dramatically, like such a good... Oh man, I don't know if I'll get to all these. Um, you didn't, uh, oh, this is my cousin. Jede Nacht wird bei mir dein Livestream angezeigt. Fai, cousin. So that's my, that's my uh, younger cousin. Hi, Fabian. Uh, did you get sorted yet? Yes, I did. I'm a Gryffindor. Gryffindor for the wheel. How come you are wearing muggle clothes today? You know what? I, I had a little bit of a frustrating day. I, I, didn't, I haven't slept uh, well uh, last night, so I was like, I'm going to take it easy. And then, and then uh, Mark pops up with a banjo and gives me energy beyond measure. <laughs> um, what do you think Dumbledore is thinking after his chat with Harry? I think he's just weighed down. You know, I, I think he's because he has to go through all these memories and explain it to Harry... You know, he, I think he takes those memories out because they're also heavy and weighed down in him. So now he had to relive them again. He's taking more out. Uh, I think he just, I think he's just weighed down by the memory and the tragedy of it and having to be there for it. What do you think of Mr. Crouch's character? Um, he's probably a great guy before he did, did this, uh, this uh, irreversible act of killing his son. Probably a good guy, you know? Crouch didn't kill his son. He sent his son off. To Azkaban, yeah. But, oh yeah, he didn't kill his son, but he kind of released him. He's like, you're not my son anymore. Yeah, yeah. And you're then not his, my son. And then his son died from being at Azkaban. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's the first place you're, uh, you're going once this quarantine is over? If you mean in Vancouver... I don't know. I'm just going to go to a bar with a dance floor with friends. That's what I want. I just want to, yeah, I just want to have some food, have some drinks, and dance with my friends. That's what I want. Is that so hard? <laughs> uh, oh, to you too, cousin. To you too. Okay, for, uh, I'm going to go longer. So uh, since maybe something weird is going to happen, it might not be right away. It might be a, a minute, maybe a minute and a half. I just want to make sure I have this video. But I'm going to log off and continue right away, okay? I'm going to continue right away as soon as I can. Okay, here we go. Mm -mm -mm. Welcome back. It's some Harry Potter rock. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock? Healthcare workers! Oh, Healthcare yeah. workers! Oh, oh, oh. In case you didn't know, I'm a freelance dancer in my time for healthcare workers because they're so awesome. Ugh. Yes! Healthcare workers! I'm not, I'm not very much into metal. There's a couple of bands and songs I do like, but this is not, not, my, not my jam. Okay. Enough of that. Let's get back into it. Because I want to keep reading. I want to see where the story goes. Oh, it's so close to the end. We should have a dance party someday. Others join. Yeah, nice moves. What's up, buddy? What's up, VJ? Uh, I don't know if you've released yet, but VJ made this uh, Lego stop motion uh, theater sports improv show. It's a video. I, I don't know if you released it yet, but anyway, awesome job, VJ. It was so good. All right, here we go. Chapter 31. We got one question. Let's see if I can pop that on. Are you a good dancer? Tell the truth. 
Um, it depends what you mean as good. <laughs> I think I am. I, 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 as in, I just let go and don't care too much. You know, I think that that's what's more about than looking good or anything like that. But I have a lot of fun. Okay, here we go. Chapter 31, the third task. Okay, here we go. Dumbled the, the, oh, where's the sound at? What happened here? There we go. Dumbledore reckons you know who's getting stronger again as well? Ron whispered. Everything Harry had seen in the pensieve, nearly everything Dumbledore had told him and shown him afterwards, he had now shared with Ron and Hermione. And, of course, with Sirius, to whom Harry had sent an owl the moment he had left Dumbledore's office. Harry, Ron, and Hermione sat up late in the common room once again that night, talking it all over until Harry's mind was reeling, until he understood what Dumbledore had meant about a head becoming so full of thoughts that it would have been a relief to siphon them off. Ron stared into the common room fire. Harry thought he saw Ron shiver slightly, even though the evening was, was warm. And he trusts Snape, Ron said. He really trusts Snape, even though he knows he was a Death Eater. Yes, said Harry. Ha Hermione had not spoken for ten minutes. She was sitting with her forehead in her hands, staring at her knees. Harry thought she, too, looked as though she could have done with a pensive. Rita Skeeter, she muttered finally. How can you be worrying about her now? said Ron in disbelief. I'm not worrying about her, Hermione said to her knees. I'm just thinking. Remember what she said to me in the three broomsticks. I know, I know, mm, I know things about Ludo Bagman that would make your hair curl. This is what she meant, isn't it? She reported his trial. She knew he'd passed information to the Death Eaters. And Winky, too, remember? Uh, uh, Mr. Misty, Misty Bagman is a, is a bad wizard. Mr. Crouch would have been furious he got off. He would have talked about it at home. Yeah, but Bagman didn't pass, pass information on purpose, did he? Hermione shrunk. One, one second, let me look at this again. Oh, right, okay, okay. Yeah, there's all these hints about Mr. Bagman being a bad person, but they're not subtle. They're straight up saying, Bagman sucks. Hey, Emmett. Yeah, but, um, Hermione shrugged. And Fudge reckons Madame Maxine. Oh, no, sorry. And, Fud, and Fudge reckons Madame Maxine. And I feel like I've just like got multiple personality disorder here. Because <laughs> I'm which, which voice is going to come out? <laughs> and Fudge reckons Madame Maxine attacked Crouch, Ron said, turning back to Harry. Yeah, said Harry. But he's only saying that because Crouch disappeared near the Bobaton's carriage. We never thought of her, did we? said Ron slowly. Mind you, she's definitely got giant blood, and she doesn't want to admit it. Yeah, sometimes I do read without reading. It's because I'm... If there's multiple voices, this isn't easy. Like, the, the jumping around between voices, I have to think, where is my voice going in, in, uh, and what I'm reading at the same time, and then paying attention to you too. <laughs> I mean, it's, sometimes I feel all over the place. <clears throat> okay. We never thought of her, did we? said Ron slowly. Mind you, she's definitely got giant blood and she doesn't want to admit it. Of course she doesn't, said Hermione sharply, looking up. Look what happened to Hagrid when Rita found out about his mother. Look at Fudge jumping to conclusions about her just because she's part giant. Who needs those sort of prejudice? I prob uh, I'd probably say I had, I had big bones if I knew what's the, uh, that's what I get for telling the truth. Hermione looked at her watch. We haven't done any practicing, she said, looking shocked. We, we were going to do the Im impediment jinx. We'll, we'll have to really get down it. We'd really have to get down to it tomorrow. Come on, Harry. You need to get some sleep. So like his coach or trainer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, Harry, drop and do ten. Harry and Ron went slowly upstairs to their dormitory. As Harry pulled on his pajamas, he looked over at Neville's bed. True to his word to, to Dumbledore, he had not told Ron and Hermione about Neville's parents. As Harry took off his glasses and climbed into his four-poster, he imagined how it must feel to have parents still living, but unable to recognize you. Yeah, he often got sympathy from strangers for being an orphan, but as he listened to Neville's snores, he thought that Neville deserved it more than he did. 
Lying in the darkness, Harry felt a rush of anger and hate towards the people who had tortured Mr. and Mrs. Longbottom. He remembered the jeers of the crowd as Crouch's son and his companions had been dragged from the court by the Dementors. He understood how, had, how they had felt. Then he remembered the milk-white face of the screaming boy and realized with a jolt that he had died a year later. It was Voldemort, Harry thought, staring up at the canopy of his bed in the darkness. It all came back to Voldemort. He was the one who had torn these families apart who had ruined all, their, all these lives. Yeah, that's pretty true. Okay, a uh, question for, question for y'all. I have a question for y'all. Uh, what's the most ridiculous thing, it can be funny, serious, whatever it is, what's the most ridiculous thing someone has tricked you into doing or believing for far too long or for a short time, anything? It can be whatever you want to say. Hey, Tim. Ron and Hermione were supposed to be revising for their exams, which would finish on the day of the third task, but they were putting most of their efforts into helping Harry prepare. Don't worry about it, Hermione said shortly. When Harry pointed this out to them and said he didn't mind practicing on his own for a while, at least we'll get top marks in defense against the dark arts. We'd never have found out about all these hexes in class. Good training for when we're all aurors said Ron excitedly. Oh no, he's happy about this. <laughs> Attempting the impediment jinx on a wasp that had buzzed into the room and making it stop dead in midair. Oh man. The mood in the castle as they entered June became excited and tense again. Everyone was looking forward to the third task, which would take place a week before the end of term. Harry was practicing hexes in every available moment. He felt more confident about this task than either of the others. Difficult and dangerous, though, though it would be uh, undoubtedly be, Moody was right. He had managed to, to find his way past monstrous creatures and enchanted barriers before now, and this time he had some notice, some chance to prepare himself for what lay ahead. My Uncle Dan taught me that green was orange and orange was green when I was a young kid, and I still say it wrong if I had to say a color quickly. No! <laughs> that is... Uh, that is kind of amazing. That is kind of amazing. Oh, that's so funny. Oh, man. Wow. Crazy, crazy, crazy. I, what's, what did you think? Did, did you, do you find it funny now, or are you annoyed about it? Yeah. I'd be interested in knowing that. Tired of walking in on, on, on them all over the school... Professor McGonagall had given Harry permission to use the empty transfiguration classroom at lunchtimes. He had soon mastered the in impediment jinx, a spell to slow down and obstruct at attackers, the reductor curse, which would enable him to blast solid objects out of his way, and the four-point spell, a useful discovery of Hermione's, which would make his wand point due north, therefore enabling him to check whether he was going in the right direction within the maze. One thing I want to know about uh, the spells that they come up with, right? Because all these older wizards and teachers, they're so good at spells, and they just like, ah, ah, and it shoots out. And people who are new at it, what is it that makes you better at spells? Is it your, like your con concentration? Is it your mental capacity of controlling a spell? Is it how you hold it in your hand? Is it a, a matter of will that pops into the wand? Like, I don't know what makes somebody bad uh, apart from... I think it's everything... I think it's all of those things. Yeah? I think. It could be like a combination of all of them. Yeah, and then certain spells are going to have a certain aspect be more important. Like the Expecto Patronum spell, Harry had to be very like mentally focused on one thing. Right. right? And a feeling, right? Yeah, 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 true. But like... Like his character came into that. Yeah, yeah. But then like the Wizardium oh. Leviosa spell was like, seems to be just like, it's a floating thing. Hmm. But maybe there's easier spells and harder spells, too. Yeah. De depending on strengths of character and will. Yeah, a com combination of all of it. They they're right. Yeah. Yeah. This was a mixture of them. Yeah. Okay. Ron and Hermione. Well, okay, then my question is... Oh, no, no. Okay, what about the, the evil wizards? Um... You know they don't have strong character, but I can, it has to, has to do, maybe it has to do with how heavily you lean into a certain quality, right? If you if you lean into um, darkness and 
death, evil, or anger, like that, those are the spells that make certain spells stronger. Ron and Hermione were supposed to be revising for their exams, which would finish on the day of the third task, but they were putting most of their efforts into helping Harry prepare. Oh, wait, we already had, had this. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, he was still having trouble with the shield charm, though. This was supposed to cast a temporary, invisible wall around himself that deflected minor curses. Hermione managed to shatter it with a well-placed jelly legs jinx. Harry wobbled around the room for ten minutes afterwards, before she had before she had looked up at the counter jinx. <laughs> That's fun. You're still doing really well, though, Hermione said encouragingly, looking down at her list and crossing off those spells they had already learnt. Some of these are bound to come in handy. Come and look at this, said Ron, who was standing by the window. He was staring down into the grounds. What's Malfoy doing? Her, Harry and Hermione went to see. Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyel were standing in the shadow of a tree below. Crabbe and Goyel seemed to be keeping a lookout. Both were smirking. Malfoy was holding his hand up to his mouth and speaking into it. It looks like he's, about, he, he's using a walkie-talkie, said Harry curiously. He can't be, said Hermione. I've told you, those sort of things don't work around Hogwarts. Come on, Harry, she asked, added briskly, turning away from the window and moving back into the middle of the room. Let's try that shield charm again. Weird. Uh, no, is the debate's still going about how, how the, what strength you have with wands, hey? Hmm. Sirius was sending daily owls now. Like Hermione, he seemed to be—he seemed to want to concentrate on getting Harry through the last task before they could concern themselves with anything else. He reminded Harry in every letter that whatever might be going on outside the walls of Hogwarts was not Harry's responsibility, nor was it within his power to influence it. If Voldemort is really getting stronger again, he wrote, my priority is to ensure your safety. He could not hope to land, lay, uh, lay hands on you while you are under Dumbledore's protection. But all the same, take no risks. Concentrate on getting through that maze safely, and then we can turn our attention to other matters. Harry's nerves mounted as June the 24th drew closer, but they were not as bad as those he had before the first and second tasks. For one thing, he was confident that this time he had done everything in his power to prepare for the task. For another, this was the final hurdle. And however well or badly he did, the tourna tournament would at last be over, which would be an enormous relief. Breakfast was a very... Uh, oh, wait. Yeah. Breakfast was a very noisy affair at the Gryffindor table on the morning of the third task. The post owls appeared, bringing Harry a good luck card from Sirius. It was only a piece of parchment, folded over and bearing a muddy paw print on its front. <laughs> but Harry appreci appreciated it all the same. A screech owl arrived for her Hermione, carrying her morning copy of the Daily Prophet as usual. She unfolded the paper, glanced at the front page, and spat out a mouthful of pumpkin juice all over. What? said Harry and Ron together, staring at her. Nothing, she said Hermione quickly, trying to shove the paper out of sight, but Ron grabbed it. He stared at the headline and said, No way. Not today. That old cow! <laughs> <laughs> what? said Har Harry. Rita Sita again? No, said Ron, and just like Hermione, he attempted to push the paper out of sight. It's about me, isn't it, said Harry. No, said Ron, in an entirely unconvincing tone. <laughs> <laughs> but before Harry could demand to see the paper, Draco Malfoy shouted across the great hall from the Sly Slytherin table. Hey, Potter! Potter! How's your head? You feeling all right? Sure, you're not going to go berserk on us. <laughs> Malfoy is holding a copy of the Daily Prophet, too. Slytherins up and down the table were sniggering, twisting in their seats to see Harry's reactions. Let me see it, Harry said to Ron. Give it here. Very reluctantly, Ron handed over the newspaper. Harry turned it over and found himself staring at his own picture beneath a banner headline. 
Mary, my dear Mary. Hello, welcome. Harry Potter, disturbed and dangerous. Harry Potter, disturbed and dangerous. The boy who defeated who he who must not be named is unstable and possibly dangerous, writes Rita Skeeter, special correspondent. Alarming evidence has recently come to light about Harry Potter's strange behavior, which casts, up, casts doubt upon his suitability to compete in a demanding competition like the Triwizard Tournament, or even to attend Hogwarts School. Potter, the Daily Prophet can exclu exclusively reveal, re regularly collapses at school and is often heard to complain of pain in the scar on his forehead, relic of the curse with which you, you, uh, with you know who attempted to kill him. On Monday last, midway through a divina divination lesson, your Daily Prophet reporter witness witnessed Potter storming from the class, claiming that his scar was hurting too badly to con continue studying. It is possible, says top experts at St. Mungus Hospital for Magi Magical Maladies and Injuries, that Potter's brain was affected by the, the attack inflicted upon him by you-know-who, and that is a... It, <laughs> this voice... <laughs> And that, his insist and, that his in and, and that his insistence that the scar is still hurting is an expression of his deep-seated confusion. He might even be pretending, said one specialist. This could, this could be a plea for attention. Oh my God. The Daily Prophet, however, has unearthed worrying facts about Harry Potter that Albus Dumbledore, headmaster of, of Hogwarts, has carefully concealed from the wizarding public. <sighs> By the way, um, Potter, can, Potter can speak parcel tongue reveals Draco Malfoy, a Hogwarts fourth year. There were a lot of attacks on students a couple of years ago, and most people thought Potter was behind them after they saw him lose his temper at a dueling club and set a snake on another boy. It was all hushed up, though. But he's made friends with werewolves and giants, too. We think he'd do anything for a bit of power. Puzzletongue, the ability to converse with snakes, has long been considered a dark art. Indeed, the most famous parcel tongue of our t parcel mouth of our time is none other than you know who himself, a member of the Dark Force Defense League who wished to remain unnamed, stated that he would regard any wizard who could speak parcel tongue as worthy of investigation. Personally, uh, as worthy of investigation. Personally, I would be highly suspicious of anybody who could converse with snakes, as serpents are often used in the worst kinds of dark magic and are histori historically asso uh, associated with evildoers. Similarly, anyone who seeks out the company of such vicious creatures are werewol as werewolves and giants would appear to have a fondness for violence. <laughs> uh, Albus Dumbledore should surely consider whether a boy such as this should be allowed to compete in the Triwizard Tournament. Some fear that, pa that Potter might resort to the dark arts at in his desperation to win the tournament. The third task, of which takes place this evening. Whoa! That was a long, long article. Jeez. Gone off a bit, hasn't he? Said Harry lightly, folding up the paper. Over on the sli- oh, That was a lot. Over on the Slytherin table, Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyel were laughing at him, tapping their heads with their fingers, pulling gr grotesquely mad faces, and waggling their tongues like snakes. How did she know your scar hurt and divination? Ron said. There's no way she was there. There's no way she could have heard. The window was open. Open, said Harry. I opened it to breathe. You were at the top of, of North Tower, Hermione said. Your voice couldn't have carried all the, the way down to the grounds. Well, you're the, the one who's supposed to be researching magical methods of bugging, said Harry. You tell me how she did, did it. I've been trying, said Hermione, but I... But... An odd, dreamy expression suddenly came over Hermione's face. She slowly raised a hand and ran her fingers through her hair. Are you all right? said Ron, frowning at her. Yes, said Hermione breathlessly. She ran her fingers through her hair again and then held up her hand, held her hand up to her mouth as though speaking into an invisible walkie-talkie. Harry and Ron stared at each other. What is going on? I've, uh, I've had an idea, Hermione said, gazing into space. I think I know, because then no one would be able to see. Even Moody. And she'd have been able to get onto the window ledge. But she's not allowed. She's definitely not allowed. I think we've got her. Just give me two seconds in the library, just to make sure. 
With that, Hermione seized her school bag and dashed out of the Great Hall. What the heck is she talking about, dude? What the heck is going on? She's smart. She'll have to tell us. She couldn't have, because no one, because no one would be able to see, even Moody. Even Moody. And she'd have been able to get onto the window ledge, but she's not but she's not allowed. She's definitely not allowed. I think we got her. Keep reading and find out. Yeah, I know. I just need to think for a second. I just want to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oi! Ron called after her. We've got a history of magic exam in ten minutes. Blimey, he said, turning back to Harry. She must really hate that skater woman to risk missing the start of an exam. What are you going to do in Bin's class? Read <coughs> again? <coughs> oh, jeez. Dry <Right> throat. <coughs> oh, boy. Okay. <clears throat> Exempt from the end-of-term tests as, tr as a Triwizard Champion, Harry had been sitting at the back of every exam class so far, looking up fresh hexes for the third class. Um, sorry, uh, oh, gosh, where, okay, found it now, okay. Exempt from the end of terms t test was, as a tri was a champion, Harry had been sitting at the back of every exam class so far, looking up fresh hexes for the third task. So, I suppose so, Harry said to Ron, but just then, Professor McGonagall came walking along, along the Gryffindor table towards him. No, no dry throat song? How sad. Ah, uh, here I go, singing at full volume. My whole life will be like this. Oh, no, what's that? There's something in the back of my throat. Now I can't sing. Uh, Potter, the champions are con uh, congregating in the cha chamber off the hall after breakfast, she said. But the task's not till tonight, said Harry, accidentally spilling scrambled eggs down his front, afraid he had mistaken the time. I'm aware of that, Potter, she said. The champion's families are invited to watch the final task, you know. Uh, you know, um, this is simply a chance for you to greet them. She moved away. Harry gaped after her. She doesn't expect the Dursleys to turn up, does she? He asked Ron blankly. Dunno. Uh, oh, uh, he asked. Oh, that was Harry. Dunno, said Harry, said Ron. Harry, I better hurry. I'm, I'm going to late. Be be late for bins. See you later. Sorry, I need a little break. <laughs> I've messed up so many times in the last minute. All right, back at it. Harry finished his breakfast in the emptying great hall. He saw Fleur de la Coeur get up on up from the Ravenclaw table and join Cedric as he crossed to the side chamber and entered. Crumb slouched off to join them shortly afterwards. Harry stayed where he was. He really didn't want to go into the chamber. He had no family. No family who would turn up to see him risk his life, anyway. But just as he was getting up, thinking that he might as well go up to the library and do a spot more hex revision, the door of the side chamber opened, and Cedric stuck his head out. Harry, come on! They're waiting for you! Utterly perplexed, Harry got up. The Dursleys couldn't possibly be here, could they? He walked across the hall and opened the door into the chamber. Cedric and his parents were just inside the door. Victor Crumb was over in a corner, conversing with his dark-haired mother and father in rapid Bulgarian. Um, he had inherited his father's hooked nose. On the other side of the room, Fleur was jabbering away in French to her mother. Fleur's little sister, Gabrielle, was holding her mother's hand. She waved at Harry, who waved back. Then he saw Mrs. Weasley and Bill standing in front of the fireplace, beaming at him. No yes. way! That is so sweet! The sweetest thing in the world! It's... Oh, come on! Bit of bad. Good people! Good people! Just want to give him a big old hug. Surprise! Mrs. Weasley said excitedly <laughs> as Harry smiled broadly and walked over to them. Thought we'd come and watch you, Harry! She bent down and kissed him on the cheek. You all right, said Bill. No, uh, you all right said Bill, grinning at Harry and shaking his hand. Charlie wanted to come, but he couldn't get time off. He said you were incredible against the horn tail. Fleur de la Cour, Harry noticed, was eyeing Bill with great... Oh, no, sorry, this was Bill, not Mr. Um, Weasley. 
uh, was eyeing Bill with great interest over her mother's shoulder. <laughs> Fleur de la Coeur wants a piece of bail. Harry could tell she had no objection whatsoever to long hair or earrings with fangs on them. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is really nice of you, Harry muttered to Mrs. M Mrs. Weasley. I thought for a moment the Dursleys... Hmm, said Mrs. Weasley, pursing her lips. She had always refrained from criticizing the Dursleys in front of Harry, but her eyes flashed every time they were mentioned. It's great being back here, said Beat Bill, looking around the chamber. Violet, the fat lady's friend, winked at him from her frame. Come on! I haven't seen this place for years, for five years. Is that a picture of the Mad Knight still around? Sir Cadogan? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Cadogan, come on, please say something, Cadogan. <laughs> said Harry, who had met Sir Cadogan the previous year. And the fat lady. Uh, she was here... Uh, she was here my time, said Mrs. Weasley. She gave me such a telling off one night when I got back to the dormitory at four in the morning. <laughs> uh, what were you doing out of your dormitory at four in the morning, said Will, surveying Mrs. Weasley with amazement. Mrs. Weasley grinned, her eyes twinkling. Oh, your father and I had... Been for a nighttime stroll. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. That's so funny. Ooh, she's a little naughty, isn't she? <laughs> she's, a, she's a little naughty one. <laughs> we just went for a stroll. <laughs> that was all. Nothing else. Uh, she said, he, he, he got caught by, by Apollyon Pringle. He was the caretaker in those days. Your father still got the marks. Fancy giving us a tour, Harry, said Bill. Yeah, okay, said Harry, as they made their way back towards the door in the Great Hall. That's so funny. Look at how many kids they have. Oh, yeah, they, they are into each other. As they passed Amos Diggory, he looked around. Uh, who? Who? Oh, Amos Diggory's there, too? Oh, right, sure. Oh, could, could be for... There you are. Uh, there you are. Are you? He said, looking Harry up and down. Bet you've not feeling quite as wet. Uh, uh, oh, he, who was he? Who was the um? Oh, what? Cedric's dad. Yeah, I know. The the voice was uh, uh not exactly. I'm sure it was something else. Anyway. It's more like working class. Yeah, working class. Yeah. Bet you're not feeling quite as full of yourself now. Cedric's caught you up on points, are you? What? Said Harry. Ignore him. Said Cedric in a low voice to Harry frowning after his father. He's been angry ever since Rita Skeeter's article, uh, article, like an American accident. He's been, he's been angry ever since Rita Skeeter's article about the Triwizard of Tournament. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's been angry ever since Rita Skeeter's article about the Triwizard Tournament. You know, when she made out you were the only Hogwarts champion. Didn't bother to correct her though, did ye? Said Amos Diggory loudly enough for Harry to hear as he made to, to walk out of the door with Mrs. Weasley and Bill. Still, you'll show him, said, beaten him once before, haven't you? Mrs. Weasley. Uh, Rita Skeeter goes out of the way to cause trouble, Amos, Mrs. Weasley said angrily. I would have thought you'd know that, working at the Ministry. I love her. Mr. Diggory looked as though he was going to say something angry, but his wife laid a hand on his arm and then smacked him right in the face in front of everybody else. <laughs> that showed him. <laughs> but his wife laid a hand on his arm and he merely shrugged and turned away Jordan Clausen going live now is trying to steal your show how dare he Harry had a, had a very enjoyable morning walking over the sunny grounds with Bill and Mr. We Mrs. Weasley showing them the Bogotan's carriage and the Durmstrang ship Mrs. Weasley was intrigued by the Wamping Willow, which had been planted after she, she had left school, <laughs> and reminisced at length about the gamekeeper before Hagrid, a man called Og. What? I wanna know about Og! I wanna know about him! What? Who's Og? I don't know why I'm so excited, because that name is wicked good. O-G-G, -G. hi, my name's Og, pleased to meet you. And then he crushes their faces. Because <laughs> that's, that's how Og do. How's Percy? Harry asked, as they walked around the greenhouses. Not good, said Bill. He's very upset, said Mrs. Weasley, lowering her voice and glancing around. The Ministry wants, want to keep Mr. Crouch's disappearance quiet, but Percy's been hauled in for questioning about the instructions Mr. Crouch has been sending him. They seem to think there's a chance they weren't genuinely written by him. 
Percy's been under a lot of strain. They're not letting him fill in for Mr. Crouch as the fifth judge tonight. Cornelius Fudge is going to be doing it. <laughs> they return to the castle for lunch. Uh, no, no, uh, he doesn't get slapped. I, I just, uh, I just said he did. They returned to the castle for, for lunch. Mum! Bill! said Ron, looking stunned, as they joined the Gryffindor table. What are you doing here? Come to watch Harry in the last task, said Mrs. Weasley, brightly. I must say, it makes a lovely change, not having to cook. <laughs> How was your exam? Oh, okay, said Ron. <laughs> Couldn't remember all the goblin rebels' names, so I invented a few. It's all right, he said, helping himself to a Cornish pastry, while Mrs. Weasley looked stern. They're all called stuff like Bodrod the Bearded and Erg the Unclean. It wasn't, a, it wasn't that hard. Fred, George, and Ginny came to sit next to them, too. And had, Harry was having such a good time, he felt almost as though he was back at the burrow. He had forgotten to worry about the evening's task, and it wasn't until Hermione turned up halfway through lunch that he remembered that she had had, had a brainwave about Rita Skeeter. Are you going to tell us? Hermione shook her head warningly and glanced at Mrs. Weasley. Yeah, it's probably the same voice I used in the play for Mrs. Beaver. Feels pretty similar. It's it's just it's toothy. It's just a, but it's the same kind of voice. But I, I did um, played a bunch of different characters in a play, Narnia, and uh, Mrs. Beaver was was like, kind of like this, more more like that, very toothy. But she became considerably warmer towards Hermione after. Oh, sorry. Harry looked between them, then said, "Mrs. Weasley, you didn't believe that rubbish Skeeter wrote in Witch Weekly, did you?" because Hermione's not my girlfriend. Oh, said Mrs. Weasley. No, 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 of course I didn't. But she became considerably warmer towards Hermione after that. Harry, Bill, and Mrs. Weasley whiled away the afternoon with a long walk around the castle, and then returned to the great hall for the evening feast. Ludo Bagman and Cornelius Fudge had joined the staff table now, Bagman looking quite cheerful, but Cornelius Fudge who was sitting next to Madame Max Maxine, looked stern and was not talking. Madame Maxine was concentrating on her plate, and Harry thought her eyes looked red. Hagrid kept glancing along the table at her. I skipped a part. What did I skip? I don't think I did. There were more courses than usual, but Harry, who was starting to feel really nervous now, didn't eat as much. As the enchanted ceiling overhead began to fade from blue to a dusk purple, Dumbledore rose to his feet at the staff table, and silence fell. Ladies and gentlemen, in five minutes' time, I will be asking you to make your way down to the Quidditch pitch for the third and last task of the Triwizard Tournament. Will the champions please follow Mr. Bagman down to the stadium now? Harry got up. The Gryffindors along the table were applauding him. The Weasleys and Hermione all wished him good luck. And he, he headed off out of the Great Hall with Cedric, Fleur, and Crumb. Feeling all right, Harry? Uh, feeling all right, Harry? Bagman asked as they went down the stone steps into the grounds. Confident. I'm okay, said Harry. It was sort of true. He was nervous, but he kept running over the hexes and spells he had been practicing in his mind as they walked and the knowledge that he could remember them all made him feel better. They walked onto the Quidditch pitch, which was now completely unrecognizable. A twenty-foot-high hedge ran all the way around the edge of it. There was a gap right in front of them, the entrance to the vast maze. The passage beyond it looked dark and creepy. Five minutes later, the stands had begun to, f begun to fill. The air was full of excited voices and the rumbling of feet as the hundreds of students filed into their seats. The sky was a deep, clear blue now, and the first stars were starting to appear. Hagrid, Professor Moody, Professor McGonagall, and Professor Flitwick came walking into the stadium and approached Bagman and the champions. They were wearing large, red, luminous stars on their hats, all except Hagrid, who had, who had hat who had his on the back of his moleskin waistcoat. We are going. We are going to, to be. We are going to be patrolling. But oh gosh, I'm losing her a bit. We are going to be patrolling the, the outside of the maze," said Professor McGonagall to the champions. "If you get into difficulty, 
and wish to be rescued, send red, send red sparks into the air and one of us will come and get you. Do you understand? The champions nodded. Off you go then, said Bagman brightly to the four patrollers. Uh, good luck, Harry, Hagrid whispered, and the four of them walked away in different directions to station themselves around the maze. Bagman now pointed his wand at, at his throat, muttered, Sonorous! Sonorous! And his magic, magically magnified voice echoed into the stands. Welcome, Nayara. Ladies and gentlemen, the third and final task of the Triwizard Tournament is about to begin. Let me remind you how the points currently stand. Tied in first place on 85 points each, Mr. Cedric Diggory and Mr. Harry Potter, both from Hogwarts School. The cheers and applause sent birds from the Forbidden Forest fluttering into the darkening sky. In second place, on 80 points, Mr. Victor Crumb of Durbstrang Institute. More applause. And in third place, Miss Fleur de la Cour, Bobatons Academy. Harry could just make out Mrs. Weasley, Bill, Ron, and Hermione applauding Fleur politely halfway up the stands. He waved up at them, and they waved back, beaming at him. So, on my whistle, Harry and Cedric, said Bagman. Three, two, one. He gave a short blast on his whistle, and Harry and Cedric hurried forwards into the maze. The towering hedges cast black shadows across the path, and whether they were so tall and thick or because they had been enchanted, the sound of the surrounding crowd was silenced the, mo the moment they entered the maze. Harry felt almost as though he was underwater again. He pulled out his wand, muttered, Lumos, and heard Cedric do the same just behind him. After about 50 yards, they reached the fork. They looked at each other. See you, Harry said, and he took the left one, while Cedric took the, took the right. Harry heard Bagman's whistle for the second time. Crumb had entered the maze. Harry sped up. His chosen path seemed completely deserted. He turned right and hurried on, holding his wand high over his head, trying to see as far ahead as possible. Still, there was nothing in sight. I gotta sh change this music, right? Yeah. Just a bit creepy now, not too tense. Uh, where are we? Everybody's saying this would be a good time to have a stopping point. Really? Yeah. Yeah, actually that's true. I only have 20 minutes and I don't want to, this is going to be, go for a while. I don't know, I might, mm, I might be able to manage this. How many, how many, 541 to... But, oh, that's 10 pages. No, I'm gonna, not going to manage that. Okay, okay, I'm going to stop here. Be careful what you wish for. Uh, that, this, is, uh, this is fun. This is going to get into some good stuff. Mm, mm, mm. Let's see some questions, shall we? Other people are like, let's go three hours. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, can you please do Okay. For the Patreon supporters, can you please read a whole news article in your newsy, newsy voice? <laughs> sure, I could do that. Uh, would you have gloated if you were exempted from exams in school? Absolutely. Yes, I am that kind of Ew. kid and student. Huh? You mean like, I didn't have to do exams. I wouldn't. I would like you. <laughs> <laughs> that would probably make me do it more. Um, how... Will the champions be ranked in the end of the third task? Yeah, what's your premonition? Who wins? Harry second. Harry second. Or even, no, third. Maybe second or third. Harry second. Cedric is first. Um, what's her name? Fleur de la Coeur is third. And, and who is the fourth person? Can't remember. Crumb. 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 He's fourth. He's last. Crumb's last? Yeah, I'm just putting him last. But isn't he tied for first right now, points-wise? Nope. Cedric and, and Harry are. Oh, Crumb right, right. Tied for right, right. Uh, uh, so I mean, I mean for this task, not for the overall standings, for this task. Oh, no. we. I want to know who, for the overall standings who you think is going to win. Um, Harry's not going to win. He's going to be second. Cedric's going to win. That's what I think. So same as we Actually, just predicted. Uh, yeah, all the same. All the same. More, more thoughts on her, how Rita's doing it. What has Hermione realized? I, I, uh, I have no idea. I have no idea. Or 
maybe what if what if she's kind of pulling memories from pe from people when they're sleeping somehow getting somebody to pull memories and so she knows exactly what's happening yeah maybe she's pulling memories from from people teachers kids when they're unaware or something like that yeah he pulls memories for them that's what i think okay thanks so much for listening this is a lot of fun i'm taking a day off sundays are my day off Oh, here we got Dexter. Uh, uh, Dexter. I have, uh, Sundays I have my day off, so we'll be back on Monday. Um, be sure to follow Mark. Uh, <laughs> go to the link in my bio to, to go to my Patreon to explore the other uh, things we do on there. And uh, you're going to play us off? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Mark's going to play us off. Play us off. Potter readings are done. They are done. They are done. See you on a Monday.